Hello everyone, welcome to the daily newspaper analysis of the Shankarayas Academy brought to you by the Civil Speedia team and in this video the current affairs for the date 3rd September would be discussed. These are the three main articles that we would be discussing in today's video. First one is from the Indian Express, plan for the farms. This article discusses about the integration of digital public infrastructure along with the uh, farmer sector so that there is efficiency of data available for the farmers and at the same time their efficiency would be increased in terms of the farmer sector. The second news is about the green power pines 30 gigawatt hard to sell where it discusses about the renewable energy and how there is potential for the renewable energy to be to have its infrastructure basis in a country India but still it is unutilized and this news article is from the Livement newspaper and finally the last article would be discussing about the establishment of the 23rd law commission by the central government so without any much further delay let's get into the articles discussion one by one before that a very small announcement the pre storming UPSC prelims test series would be starting from the 6th of September batch 1 and along with it to boost your UPSC mains preparation with us All India UPSC mains open mock test 2014 would be conducted so interested aspirants can apply for the test series so moving on to the first news almost 30 gigawatt of renewable energy are still unsold in India due to purchase and supply agreements delay. Older projects are still finding new buyers due to tariff issues, grid connectivity issues, etc. So now there is the industry is waiting for the need of having a uniform tariffs and along with it to have an energy storage linked projects to further impact the demand. Before going into the statistics on the green energy, let us see a very basic idea or overview of what renewable energy is and what are its ultimate goals. So first, under the national energy policy of India, it aims for locally produced energy in India and also at the same time to reduce energy poverty through renewable resources. So as you all know, renewable resources are the use of non-fossil fuels such as solar, wind, hydro, that is water power and bioenergy and geoenergy. According to the IEA report, that is International Energy Agency report, by 2040, 37 percentage of the power generations is expected to come from the renewable energy, which is compared to 23 percentage for today. So renewable energy is one of the key future plans for a country like India as well as uh, when it comes to global energy consumption. For current situation of pollution and energy consumption, having a mindful thoughts on using renewable energy is the dire need of the hour. So our country India has uh, taken the initiative of national energy policy to produce energy through the renewable resources available. And in 2017, it had its major amendment. The policy had its major amendment change and it included NDC that is uh, nationally determined contract contributions which aim to reduce emissions and also had a target to achieve the renewable energy capacity to 175 gigawatt but in 2022 unfortunately we missed the count but through recent reports we have achieved more than it so under national energy policy along with these initiatives there are also a lot of initiatives and uh, pollution and emission control initiatives taken to combat climate change along with lot of ministries now after seeing an overview of what an, uh, renewable energy is now let us move on to the current statistics of the news now as i told in 2022 we have missed the target but in 2024 as of recent report, India has installed renewable energy capacity which is almost 197 gigawatts. Now under the uh, national energy policy, the government targets to achieve 500 gigawatt of non-fossil fuel capacity by 2023 through the renewable resources which is almost 40 percentage. And also in commitment with the Paris Agreement along with the NDCs, the policy also uh, aims to reduce carbon intensity and increase the non-fossil fuel share by 50 percentage by 2023 also. To achieve this twin objective, uh, usage of renewable resources such as uh, solar, water and biomass and wind is very important and especially when it comes to solar that 30 gigawatt also makes a difference. Now let us move on to the key segments of renewable energy.
energy. First is the solar energy. Installed capacity is increases more than 70 gigawatts and the potential is almost 749 gigawatts in a country like India. So initiatives like PM Kusum aims for promoting rural solar power energy. Also missions like uh, National Solar Mission aims for national solar grids which is also called as National Smart Grid Missions. Now the wind energy, the installed capacity is approximately 43 gigawatt which is the fourth largest globally. Now right now it focuses on the offshore wind which has the potential of uh, 302 gigawatts. Next is the hydropower energy. It is installed with a capacity of almost 51 gigawatts along with small hydro projects. It also aimed for uh, promotion of pumped storage projects. It also aimed for uh, pumped storage project or called as PSP for grid stability and finally is the bioenergy it accounts for almost uh, 10 gigawatt with a significant potential from agriculture and forest of our country and it is supported by national bioenergy program here here we need to see the key differences between green energy versus renewable energy of course both uh, contains same non fossil fuels which is the hydro solar uh, wind and biomass but green energy is almost having no potentiality to harm the environment but under renewable energy uh, projects which includes hydro has the capacity to harm the environment through the projects dams and so on as during the construction of dams uh, migration of fish or uh, destruction of the fish population can happen so both are not the same all green energy are renewable energy but not all renewable energy are green energy now moving on to the policy frameworks included when it comes to solar and also the same same time when it comes to renewable energy. Here, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy is a nodal agency for almost promoting renewable energy. Next is the Renewable Purchase uh, Obligations or the RP. RPOs where it mandates a percentage of electricity from the renewable resources and it comes under the Ministry of Power. Next is the solar parks and ultra mega solar power projects and it supports large scale solar power plants and this comes under the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. And finally is the viability gap funding coming under the Ministry of Finance. It helps to have a financial support for renewable energy. So the viability gap funding is also part of public private partnerships programs in India. Now let us see the few challenges and opportunities when it comes to the renewable energy. In relation to the solar energy, there are a lot of grid connectivity and storage issues such as the uh, integration, modernization, updation of the solar panels and also uh, having uh, energy based linked storage solutions so that, so that the use of renewable energy is implemented both efficiently and effectively as still the problem is infrastructure exists but but it is still not utilized properly next is the financing and investment issues having issues like the high capital cost it affects the infrastructure base the sectors attracts investment but still there are problems like the discom financial health discom is nothing but the state electricity distribution companies where there is lack of fund and finally is the technology and innovation now there are lot of improvements like green hydrogen, white hydrogen and so on. So there need to be focus on green hydrogen, floating solar, offshore wind uh, for capacity expansion and as well as exploration. So uh, under this topic we have seen an overview of the policies, uh, different type of ministries, few initiatives and at the same time uh, differences between uh, renewable resources, green energy uh, and different type of aspects when it comes to renewable resources. So for, from the prelims perspective, having a note on these ministries, having a note on such policies, initiatives would be important and also this article has the potentiality to be as a main answer writing through even more analysis. Now I hope that you all have a clear and uh, and uh, best overview on what the article is about. Le now let us move on to the next article. Before that let's have a, a prelims practice question. Consider the following statements regarding the Pradhan Mantri Kisan uh, Urja Suraksha Ivam Uthan Mahabhyan that is the PM Kusum scheme. It aims to install grid connected solar power plants in rural areas. It provides financial assistance for the installation of solar pumps for irrigation purposes. 
the scheme focuses exclusively on the large scale solar parks which of the statement given above is or are correct the answer is option a both the statements are right as uh, the financial assistance is given through the national fund and at the same time option 3 is wrong because exclusively such an extreme word it also uh, focuses on small scale solar park so through these words upsc has the uh, tendency to eliminate or to confuse a lot of aspirants so look check on for such words and let us move on to the next article now coming to the second news the national cabinet have approved rupees 2800 crore for the digital agricultural mission along with the creation of digital public infrastructure for the agricultural sector to bring in data and information for about the farmlands crops and yields thus it affects the farmer sector in the most efficient way to just to have a overview digital agricultural mission was established in 2023 under the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare whereas dpi that is the digital public infrastructure is a digital uh, mission or a digital system which enables efficient and effective delivery services like the uh, g locker under the ministry of electronic and information technology and also aadhar services other services like the upi unified payment interface under the ministry of rbi and national payments corporation of india so these digital infrastructure would help for having a unified data and at the same time such data can be used in different aspects or different sectors of the society so this news uh, focuses to integrate dpi in agriculture so here the digital agriculture division has uh, inculcated comprehensive ict strategy that is information and communication technologies to enhance farmers uh, awareness knowledge and efficiency when it comes to agricultural schemes agricultural products and so on that is thus it enhances outreach planning and monitoring of schemes for the benefit of farmers in one click and at the same time the uh, digital agriculture mission focuses on integrating the ne gpa that is national e governance plan in agriculture which is a centrally sponsored scheme which helps to update uh, to include new and emerging technologies in the digital agriculture so it is a synergy of more than one infrastructure or institutes which tries to help the farmer sector in a whole basis now let us move on to see few digital infrastructure uh, initiatives when it comes to agriculture first under websites and uh, web portals website called e nam that is national agricultural market it is an uh, online trading platform or a system for agricultural products to be sold where it also integrates 100000 uh, mandis or agricultural markets across 18 states and union territories to produce better price delivery and at the same time to reduce uh, intermediaries between the market and the farmer so the actual price is benefited to the farmers next is the sms advisories uh, app like m kisan sms portal sends personalized uh, messages or information uh, relating to agriculture and also about uh, advisories related to the agriculture through the sms the key component is the message will be delivered in local languages even without internet access next is again a mobile app which is called kisan suvidha app it provides information on uh, weather updation market prices agricultural advices or services and provides repeat panna and also provides details on crop of insurance it uh, helps to make the farmers to have a very informed decision thus they are aware of their own productivity and at the same time they are aware of the income it can foster so this app helps the farmers to be more aware and next is the kisan call center where it provides personalized information through toll free number now let us move on to the dpi mission in agriculture dpi in the agricultural sector is a government initiative which helps to create a comprehensive and enhanced digital ecosystem thus to moder- modernize the infrastructure and at the same time support the farmer sector as right now the world is moving through digitalization let us see the key components of the dpi infrastructure first is the agri stack it includes farmers registry where there is creation of uh, id for the farmers and their ids are linked to the records of land so that there isn't any uh, fraudulent when it comes to acquisition of land and also details on the livestock and crops they 
own and benefits that they are entitled to. Thus, it uh, helps them to have a very simple access to the services and at the same time, there isn't any need for them to go through the bureaucratic hurdles. Next is the crop zone registry. This is uh, digitally records crop details uh, which is planned for each season through mobile based service. Next is the geo referenced village maps. Here it links the land records with physical locations for better management and planning of their uh, crops and being aware of the land that they can use in so that they can acquire a land without any bureaucratic problems and so on. Next is the Krishi decision support system, a geospatial system which unifies the data on crop, soil, weather and water resources especially for crop mapping. Thus, it helps to find the potentiality when it comes to groundwater resources and so on to enhance the crop yields eventually. And next is the soil profile maps where there is detailed soil maps for improved soil management. Here it covers almost 142 million hectares of agricultural lands which also promotes sustainability. And finally, let us see the impact on farmers and the farm sector through the intervention of DPI. First is the access to the services. As I told before, it simplifies a lot of government schemes, uh, government procedures and when it comes to uh, subsidies, the, the MSPs are also made aware to them in the most simplest way and also to have a financial inclusion. First, they need to know what, it, what are the financial services provided for the farm sector. So, in a larger perspective, such such a unified data platform will help for the farmers and the farm sector equally. Next point is the improved crop management. Through these uh, digital tools, it helps for the crop yield, crop prediction and therefore it ultimately helps the farmers to have a best decision for them even though so when it comes to agriculture, there are a lot of uh, unforeseen factors. Next is the accurate crop estimation. This estimation helps to have the farmers to have better planning and at the same time to have better knowledge on the resource allocation so that they don't find failures of their crops. Next is the enhanced transparency and efficiency. Now through having knowledge of the crop insurance policies, credit allocations and so on, farmers are well aware of their uh, potentiality when it comes to both land and finance. And finally to have crop diversification in and irrigation. It ultimately promotes crop patterns and optimization of the irrigational needs. Now, let us see the practice question for this article. Consider the following statements uh, regarding DPI. The DPI mission aims to establish a foundational digital infrastructure to enable efficient delivery of public services. The DPI mission includes initiatives like the Aadhaar UPI DigiLocker and its core components. The DPI mission is a collaborative effort involving only the central government with no participation from the state government or private sectors. Let us see the answer. The answer is obviously option 1 and 2. Of course, both the answers, uh, both the statements are correct. The DPA mission's uh, larger objective is including the not only the central but also the state participation and other private sectors. Moving to the last article for today. And the final article for today is the th 23rd Law Commission. The central government has constituted the 23rd Law Commission for a term of three years. The new commission can include serving judges from the Supreme Court as well as the High Court as its chairperson and the and its members. The term of the previous uh, Law Commission that is the 22nd Law Commission ended on August 31st. Now let us have a brief look on what is Law Commission. It is a non-statutory body constituted by the Government of India to undertake legal researches and review the existing law. The first pre-independence law commission was established 1834 by the British Government Charter Act 1833 chaired by Lord Macaulay and after independence it was first established in 1955 and since then it has played a crucial role in law reforms of our country India. The commission works on these specific legal issues as referred by the government and suggests changes to the existing law as well as uh, it recommends new law to address the emerging challenges for a country like India. Thus, the Law Commission can be considered as a ad hoc body which is nothing but a body created for specific purposes formed by the union government established to serve specific purposes and in reference to 
law. It, uh, its primary function is to act as an advisory body to the Ministry of Law and Justice. Here, the Law Commission is not explicitly defined in the Constitution, even though it plays an important role, but it is constituted in line with the principles laid out in the Article 39A, uh, thus to ensure that the legal system functions to promote justice based on equal opportunities for all. Now, let us move on to the uh, structure and the functions of the Law Commission of India. Law Commission was created when the Union Government passes a resolution for the formation of new commission after the expiry of the last one. Now looking into the functions of the law commission, as I said before, it studies and reviews laws, existing laws as well as it uh, brings changes to the outdated laws and also has the capacity to bring new laws. Uh, because of its advisory nature, its recommendations are non-binding, but no matter what, they are highly influential. Looking into the structure, the Law Commission is, is composed of chairperson who is a retired Supreme Court judge usually and several other members who are legal experts and scholars. Now let us look at the recent work done by the Law Commission of India and its relevance. The 21st Law Commission from 2015 to 2018 is known for its remarkable recommendation which is the Uniform Civil Code in India chaired by the Justice B.S. Chauhan. Along with the Uniform Civil Code, there were key issues being recommended such as the electoral reforms and abolition of death penalty for non-terrorism related offences. And the 22nd Law Commission uh, was tasked with several uh, important issues as well as ongoing reforms such as reviewing the sedation law, personal data protection and other reforms in criminal law. The commission also equally looked into uh, several sensitive issues like age of consent and uh, marital rape, right? making its debate, making its recommendation highly debatable and relevant for today's scenario of the legal reforms in India. Now let us look into the key reports and recommendations of the Law Commission. First is the, as I told before, Uniform Civil Code. The Commission tried to explore the feasibility of implementing a Uniform Civil Code which is the a set of code or set of rules which replaces the personal laws based on religion with a common set of goals for the all citizens. Next is the electoral reforms. This aimed to uh, improve transparency and reduce corruption in the electoral process. Next is the 170th report of the Law Commission on Electoral Reforms 1999. Here it suggested to have idea on conducting simultaneous elections for the Lok Sabha and for the state assemblies to enhance governance as well as stability in the states. Next rec recommendation is about the death penalty. It recommended to provide death penalty for all crimes except for terrorism and other crimes related to war against the state, which indeed became a very controversial debate to be discussed on by the public. And apart from these uh, reports and recommendations, it also went through a lot of significant changes in relevance to the changes when it comes to Indian laws. For example, decriminalization of certain offences, changes in criminal procedures, codification of personal laws are key uh, issues to be noted. Thus, exploring uh, other areas in relevance to the Indian law, it acts as a platform for judicial interpretation and such debates can uh, enhance uh, implementing of legislative action. Now, sorry, let us see a prelims practice question based on this article. Which of the following statements about the Law Commission of India is correct? The Law Commission is a permanent body established under Article 39A of Indian Constitution. The Law Commission functions as an advisory body in the Ministry of Law and Justice and is constituted for specific purposes. The Law Commission's recommendations are binding on the government. The Law Commission must be constituted for every five years by the Parliament. The answer is Option B. Of course, we did see that Law Commission is not entitled with the uh, constitutional rights and at the same time their recommendations are non-binding and it is co constituted every three years and not five years. Thus, option B is correct which is it is an advisory body. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to give a like, comment and a share and to further not to miss any other contents from our channel, subscribe to our channel. Thank you and have a great day.